Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with Dr. Stacy Ochoa, presenting Early Identification and Treatment for Pediatric Sleep Disordered Breathing. I'm Shaylin, the Association Manager for the AACP, and I will be the host of the webinar tonight. The webinar is approximately 50 minutes, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. AACP has no conflicts of interest. Registrants can expect to receive a recording of this presentation via email within five to seven business days, and attendees will receive their CE certificate of attendance within 30 days of the webinar air date. I would like to briefly mention two upcoming events for the AACP. Our next complimentary webinar will be November 9th with Dr. Angela Tenholder and Dr. Kim Letterman presenting laser-assisted non-surgical treatments for craniofacial pain and sleep disordered breathing. Also on October 28th through 29th, AACP is hosting a two-day advanced injections course in South Bend, Indiana. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Stacy Ochoa. Dr. Ochoa graduated from the St. Louis Community College Forest Park Dental Hygiene Program in 1995. She went to dental school at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Dentistry, graduating with distinction and honors in 2002. She is a diplomate with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and certified with special knowledge and training in dental sleep medicine. Dr. Ochoa actively pursues continuing education to incorporate the latest techniques and advanced treatments for her patients. She is proud to offer her patients microscope enhanced dentistry, which allows intraoral structures to be examined at an extremely high level of magnification, facilitating a more thorough diagnosis and precise treatment. Since 2008, Dr. Ochoa has repeatedly been awarded St. Louis's top dentist status by St. Louis Magazine. She enjoys volunteering and giving back to the community with events like Give Kids a Smile, which she hosted in 2009. Outside of work, Dr. Ochoa loves spending time with her husband and five beautiful children. With that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Ochoa. Thank you so much, Shaylin. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I know, I mean, I'm still in my scrubs. <laughs> so um, I know we've all had a long day. It's the beginning of the week. Hump day is almost here. Um, but I feel like this is such an important message. And I'm very appreciative that you took the time out of your day to spend time with me and listen to um, just a little bit of what I have to say and listen to my story because I have a feeling my story is probably most of your stories as well. And uh, I wanted to give credit to Dr. Steve Carsonson because um, he really came up with this tagline that dentists are really becoming the primary care of the airway. And we really should be prepared for that. And the American Dental Association has a call to action for not only adult but pediatric um, evaluation and referring and intervention and as appropriate. And we as dentists really are the primary care of the airway and need to um, know what we're looking at and know when to refer appropriately. And if we're trained appropriately, know when to intervene ourselves with therapies. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Shailene. I'm a diplomate, the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. I actually also am serving on the dental task force for the American Association of Sleep Medicine. I've been managing adult OSA with mandibular advancement devices for about 20 years. And my dad was what, who was what catapulted me into that because he had OSA and he was CPAP intolerant and really is the reason for my beginning of the journey. Then I have five children with all different levels, types of upper airway resistance, sleep disorder, breathing, um, sleep issues. And they're the why for the second half of my sleep journey. Um, and as a mom, I needed answers. 
um, which here's my conflict of interest, is I am a co-founder of ASAP Pathway, which is Airway Sleep and Pediatric Pathway. So I'll go into a, a little bit about my story with, with my dad. Um, my dad struggled with CPAP intolerance. And when I got out of dental school, uh, the sleep physicians in town said, why aren't you making a device for your dad? Nobody's doing this. And um, I really am the type of person I do it all or don't do it at all. You know, I want to know it fully or I won't touch it. And so I figured, well, my dad's a, a good enough reason to really get involved. So I made my dad an advancement device. And over the years, I started having kids and I started seeing, you know, as much as I love my dad and want my children to be like my dad, I didn't want my children to grow up to have the same health issues my dad had. So when I started no noticing mouth breathing and bruxism and bedwetting and just different things in my kids, and I thought, oh my gosh, they're on the same path as my dad. And um, so I started just traveling all over the country, just different expansion courses, myobrace, healthy start, just looking for that magic answer. And, uh, you know, as a mom, you're desperate for answers and you'll do anything for your kids. And my dad was like, why are you flying all over the place? And I said, I want to help my kids, your grandchildren, dad, they're not sleeping well. And as miserable as you are and all the stuff you have going on. I mean, I just don't want them to go through this. I mean, they don't breathe through their nose. And my dad said, wait, hold on. What do you mean? They don't breathe through their nose. I said, they don't breathe through their nose. Well, and my dad said, you know, I've never been able to breathe through my nose. I don't remember ever being able to breathe through my nose. And I mean, this is my dad in his early sixties. And I'm like, what? So I started looking back at pictures of my dad. And I mean, my dad always did have an open mouth posture. He always, he struggled breathing through his nose. And I thought, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what if somebody could have identified something in my dad as a young boy um, and it would have changed the trajectory of his life. So um, my dad, again, he's my hero in all of this. And unfortunately, my dad lost his, um, lost his life in his sleep. Uh, he did not have his uh, appliance in that night. And um, he had a lot going on in life too. I mean, a lot of back problems, neck problems, but ultimately what took his life was he stopped breathing in his sleep and never took another breath. So I always want to honor my dad because he's the reason I'm, I'm doing this. So Sorry, I get a little get a little upset, but um, I love him so much, and he's still my hero to this day. And I know that if if this tonight can help one practitioner go to work tomorrow and just look a little differently at people, then I know that would make him so so very proud um, that he could have helped somebody in some small way as well. Um, this is my family. This is so outdated, but it's the only picture I have of my kids of all of this together. My youngest in the flannel is six foot two now. So, I mean, this is very outdated. Uh, they're all so grown and I love them so much, but they're my why. Um, and this is a glimpse into why I started diving more into the non-anatomical aspects of airway and sleep health. I mean, I'm gonna talk about anatomy tonight. It's important as dentists. I mean, geez, we are trained to look at anatomy. I mean, we got that nailed. But something that we really need to start looking at is listening to our patients and asking more questions because there are non-anatomical aspects to help us sleep at night, to maintain that patent airway, um, to help with the tone of that airway, um, to help us go through all the sleep phases like we're supposed to. And this is like a mom's worst nightmare is I got one kiddo in the hospital, my son on the left, Judah. Um, he was getting his tonsils and adenoids out. Um, I did everything I could to avoid it, but at the end of the day, it needed to be done. And so as he's recovering from TNA surgery for OSA, my other son is in New York City. I'm in Missouri with my one son and my other son went on a 24 hour bus ride to New York city and had basically sleep deprivation 
and went into a full grand mal seizure in Times Square. Never had a seizure a day in his life. Um, had a history of migraines, and that is a a flag for uh, potential neurological issues and can lead to things like um, seizures. And so I got a phone call from the school chaperones and the choir instructor that they were in the hospital with my other son. Um, but this is where as a mom, you're like, okay, I get it. what in the heck is going on with sleep in my life that I'm not figuring out. I've asked all the primary cares. I've done everything everyone has said to do, but something is not right. My children are not sleeping well. And so as we all know, a worried mother does better research than the FBI. So again, this is where I co-founded with um, two of my other partners, uh, Tracy Wynn and Michelle Weddle, ASAP Pathway. So let's talk about, you know, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, this association is known for understanding, um, understanding craniofacial pain, TMD, as well as sleep better than most associations that we have. So I feel like I'm preaching the choir, but I'm hoping that there's something, maybe something I can um, shed a little light on that maybe you didn't think about, or you might want to further investigate. So when we're looking at snoring, upper airway resistance, and then full-blown obstructive sleep apnea, you don't just wake up one day with sleep apnea. It, there's a transition. There was a starting point where things just didn't go well. Um, and if we can start identifying in these younger kiddos where things are kind of going askew, then we could really potentially change the trajectory of their lives. Most of us are familiar with oral appliance therapy for adults, um, advancement devices, basically keeping that airway patent mechanically um, as an alternative to CPAP therapy. And I think a lot of us are, most of us are familiar with that. And really that's more of a mechanical, we're looking at the anatomy here. So we've got a nine-year-old, we have a 15-year-old, and we have a 37-year-old. So here's the nine-year-old. Again, these are CBCTs, SEFs. Um, these are static images of a dynamic airway. So I'm not saying use a CBCT to diagnose airway problems. Um, I'm not saying that at all. Um, but what I am saying is, you know, if everything is right within the positioning, I mean, it can show us some glimpses of, hmm, if you do have an airway problem already, I wonder if that constriction is most likely in the smallest part of this image. But what you do with the 37 year old here, you know, we have mandibular advancement devices, we have CPAP, we have um, MMA surgeries to correct the anatomy. What are we gonna do on the 15 year old? Well, we're not gonna put in advancement devices yet. That's 18 and older. There's CPAP not likely to do MMA surgery, not fully done growing yet. What are we gonna do with this nine-year-old? We got TNA removal, we have CPAP. You know, what are our options? You know, this is partially an anatomical problem, but not fully. So what if we can intervene in children early, change their future health? So let's talk about some different options that exist for kids with sleep and airway issues. So we know with adults, we can do maxillomandibular advancement surgery and we can open that airway more so. But what about in kiddos? What if we could non-surgically bring the face more forward, expand from a transverse aspect and a sagittal aspect, increase nasal patency by helping that palate improving that airway by bringing that mandible and the maxilla forward. So this is a kiddo here that, um, this is from Dr. Tracy Wynn. This, an ENT had referred this kiddo to her and she got them off CPAP, which is life-changing for a kiddo. Um, does this mean this child's cured for life? No, but in this moment, in this phase of this child's life, she changed their life. Um, I'm very hesitant to ever use the words cure sleep apnea because quite frankly, 
we don't even fully know what sleep apnea is. Um, we know it's a chronic inflammatory state, but we go through different phases, stages of growth and development. Um, I'm very leery of anybody that says they're going to cure um, sleep apnea because you can't say that. You don't know if that kid in five years is going to have something else happen or gain weight or um, start having other issues. So I always like to be careful. And especially when talking to parents, you know, physicians never say cure apnea. And if we start throwing that around, um, our medical colleagues are going to be leery of us as well. Um, but definitely we can help manage and walk alongside these kids in this journey um, and improve their life and take obstacles out of their way. That's what we're here for is to um, collaborate with our medical colleagues, remove obstacles and help kids live the best version of themselves in this moment. So I'll go over some pediatric uh, medical comorbidities. A lot of this can overlap with adults as well. Um, and I'm not gonna you know, go over, I had a lot of slides for all of this, but I'm trying to keep it short because I will, I tend to talk a lot. So <laughs> I'm trying to keep this abbreviated. So GERD, this can be with adults and with um, children as well. And sometimes they don't, especially kids, if they've had GERD their whole life, they don't even know that that's not normal. Um, so mention things like, do you have a sour taste? Obviously we can see evidence of erosion on the dentition, but even like, do you feel like you have to clear your throat all the time? Do you feel like there's a lump there? Um, and sometimes kiddos will identify with that. Like, yeah, I clear my throat a lot, or I feel like there's a lump there. Um, asthma, ADD, ADHD, morning headaches. We should wake up feeling refreshed, not waking up with headaches. Um, excessive daytime sleepiness, nocturnal enuresis for children or with adults getting up to use the restroom a lot, periodic limb movements. And I could have an entire one hour, probably two hour lecture just on periodic limb movements and restless leg syndrome. It's a very under discussed um, issue that is just as restless leg is just as prevalent as diabetes but less diagnosed. And it has just as much, RLS has just as much of a quality of life burden um, as uh, diabetes as well. I'll talk a little bit more about um, periodic limb movements and dopamine and iron a, a little bit later, but also cardiovascular changes. There's studies showing before OSA treatment and after OSA treatment and the relief of core polynol in children um, so it is massively influential. And if we can intervene with these kids and ask these questions um, in our health histories and really dive in and not just, you know, open, say, ah, and look at the white things, just back it up and look at this person, look at this kiddo as a whole. Um, Frontiers in Neurology, um, this article, OSA in Children Can Lead to Cognitive and Behavioral Deficits. Basically, they were looking at cortical thicknesses in children with OSA, um, and they showed a difference in the thickening of the um, cortical thicknesses and noticing that both thinning and thickening associated with children with OSA can contribute to cognitive and behavioral dysfunction frequently found in that condition. Um, this is Dr. Sheldon and Dr. Ghazal. Um, Dr. Stephen Sheldon, he's out of uh, Children's Hospital, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Um, big proponent of before any child is prescribed a stimulant for ADD, ADHD. We really need to have a sleep consultation um, before we start pushing the drugs because a lot of times um, it can be that it's sleep deprivation and it's not really um, an issue all by itself. It's more of a syndrome of an underlying cause. Dr. David Gazal, he is now in um, Missouri. He was in Chicago and he moved to uh, Mizzou and my neck of the woods. And what he is doing with pediatric sleep medicine is unbelievable. Um, just had an interview with him uh, about a month ago and they have already developed biomarker testing where they can test the plasma of a child. And within an hour, 
they can tell within 95% certainty if that child has OSA and cognitive deficits based on the uh, gene markers that they're testing. And he believes fully, you know, they're going to get this nailed down and it's eventually going to be like a five minute result test that, you know, instead of these um, PSGs, which are cumbersome, um, expensive, we also have an issue with access to care to even find pediatric um, PSG abilities sometimes, but also we get so many false um, negatives. Uh, kids are different. Sometimes it comes back no apnea, but we know we have a very sick child who is struggling. So I wish it would come faster, but just know that there are people working really hard. Um, you know, we think we're crazy about pediatric sleep health. David Gazal is on fire about pediatric sleep health. He is just an amazing, amazing um, physician. Dr. Um, Sheldon basically proposed this renaming of, you know, ADD or ADHD. And it used to be called MBD, minimal brain damage. That's what they used to call this. Uh, but then they couldn't find the damage, so then they renamed it to minimal brain dysfunction. Um, and so now they're calling it attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And what he's really wanting to start calling this is a syndrome. Uh, because we really need to get rid of the words like dysfunction, disorder, and damage and start talking about a syndrome and what is the cause of the syndrome. A study done in 2017 in the journal Medicine looked at the connection of obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea syndrome, and ADD, ADHD. And I'll summarize the findings, but the ratio of boys to girls with OSAHS was two to one. The ratio of boys with ADHD to girls was two to one. And ADHD occurrence correlated with an increase in allergic rhinitis and adenoid hypertrophy in the age group four to six. And then the occurrence correlated higher with rates of tonsil hypertrophy ages six to 11, which I find this in my practice a lot and you probably do too. In that small age, you know, the young, the littles, I always call them the littles in my practice, two, three, four, five, six years old it's usually an adenoidal problem or allergy, something going on in the nose, behind the nose. And then we start seeing a transition to uh, more of a tonsil issue a little bit later. Um, and they did also find an increase in respiratory events as well as hypoxia is correlated with an increase in ADHD. So the take home message is obstructions in breathing, need to be removed as soon as possible to decrease the chance of a child developing ADD, ADHD. Um, there was a Karen Bonick study done um, on thousands of kiddos and just, just the fact that they snored and just the cognitive deficits that took place. Um, there was another study done on children at 13 years old. Um, even though they didn't snore any longer, if they snored at under the age of six, they were most likely to be in the lower third of their class. Even though they no longer snored, they grew out of it, if you will. The fact that they did snore between four to six years old, it put them at a disadvantage. These are long-term effects. And that sweet spot is five to six years old. Um, so it's, we got to take action and take action as soon as we see the issue. Uh, and we see these kiddos more than their own pediatrician sometimes. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Amen Clinic. I actually took two of my five kiddos to the Amen Clinic um, to have a spec scan done. And it is mind blowing what you can see. They do a... Um, a cognitive one and they also do a relaxed one so they do one where you're just chill relax they scan the brain and then they do another one after they do some questions and they, they challenge the brain and then they do another scan and it's super interesting and they've identified like different types of ADD seven different varieties of ADD 
and just showing that psychiatry, which tends to be one of the only professions that doesn't look at the organ that they're treating, um, they're trying to change that by saying, hey, you know, let's not be a symptom-based profession. Let's start looking at the brain where the hyperactivity is and where the underactivity is. But they have scanned brains before and after treatment of OSA, and they can identify a, a brain with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, they have a definite trademark and what it looks like and where the deficits are. Um, even from like, they'll give vitamin D supplementation. They're really big in some of the non-anatomical aspects to help improve sleep health as well. And the changes they see in the brain. Um, just very, a very big fan of the Amen clinics, but they're showing us what we've always known. We know something's different. We know something's not right. And they're finally saying, see, there is a brain that's sleep deprived and here's a brain that isn't sleep deprived. And there is a difference. So I'm going to dive in a little bit more to periodic limb movements. So there's restless leg and there's periodic limb movements. Um, this is going to go into a little bit more of some of the non-anatomical aspects. Periodic limb movements are episodes that are detected in sleep during a PSG. Um, literally, pe periodic limb movements is just that. It's a diagnosis during a PSG. You cannot diagnose it through a home sleep test because there aren't any leads on the legs. Um, so they can't detect periodic limb movement. So it's PSG findings only. However, restless leg syndrome happens while a patient is awake. And they're very aware usually that they have restless leg syndrome. And usually they're unable to kind of control the movements and things like that. But definitely in, in their sleep, they have no control over a periodic limb movement. Um, it can severely disrupt sleep um, and it can cause arousals. Uh, they, like if you have people like patients, children that are sleepwalking or have a lot of leg pain, this could be a sign that they might have periodic limb movements. But then you further question too, well, what is it like when you're awake? Because not all patients with periodic limb movements have restless leg syndrome. Um, and not all people with restless leg syndrome have periodic limb movements, but a lot of times people with PLMs also have restless leg. So this is when we start getting into some of the nutritional aspects. Um, iron, for instance, is essential for a lot of our biological functions, um, but in mostly, you know, including in this, this section, neurotransmitter synthesis. So Iron is a cofactor for tyrosine hydroxylase, and that converts tyrosine to dopamine. So you need iron to convert tyrosine to dopamine. D levels also can affect iron levels. So if your D levels, your vitamin D, pro-hormone really, but not a vitamin, if those levels are off, your iron levels are going to be off. And iron levels affect dopamine levels and also the transportation of that dopamine. And that affects the periodic limb movements experienced in sleep. And that affects restless leg syndrome. And like I said, I, could, I have an entire lecture. I'm actually gonna talk, um, Angie and I are gonna speak on this, but I have an entire lecture just on restless leg. I cannot emphasize enough how you need to start asking your patients that Brooks your patients that are grinding like nobody's business. Do you, uh, you know, there's a whole restless leg questionnaire that you can ask. It's like 10 questions, but, you know, especially, you know, do you feel like you have to move your legs? Do you move your legs a lot in your sleep? When you start to get tired, do you feel like your legs are uneasy or achy or they, you have to move like an intense desire to move them? Those patients also tend to have bruxism sometimes, not always. But they have found that bruxism occurs right after an arousal. And the arousal tends to be a tibial arousal. So you get the leg movement, boom, then you get the bruxism. And these are patients that, I mean, they're busting your appliances up. They're busting their veneers up. Just start asking about their legs and then you can order some blood work. 80% of people with RLS 
also have PLMs, which is the periodic movements in their sleep that are detected on a PSG. This can be linked to low iron. And like I said, essential for uh, the neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, converting tyrosine to dopamine. The lack of dopamine can cause those movements. So what we typically wanna see is a serum ferritin, a fasting serum, serum ferritin level. We want it to be at least 75. We really want it to be greater than 75 if you have RLS. But anything lower to 45 to 50, especially in kiddos too, is associated a lot of times with restless leg syndrome. So normally you wanna be at 75 or higher, but if you have RLS, we wanna even see you in the hundreds. Um, and then we also wanna see the transparent iron saturation greater than 20%. I mean, really, if you have RLS, we almost wanna see that closer to 45%. So vitamin D and iron, there's this feedback system between the two and it has to do with hepcidin, but they're, they're connected and you can't separate it. So we really, as a society, need to look at, you know, what is our vitamin D level? And we don't go out in the sun enough. And when we do, we're lathered up with um, sunscreen. So we're not making the pro-hormone that we need to make all these other cofactors and um, you know our gut biome and everything else to be healthy. And our gut, I mean, that makes everything. Our neurotransmitters, it's our immune system. And there's so much research connecting vitamin D health and the microbiome. Vitamin D is a bacterial growth factor. When the vitamin D levels are low, the gut biome is just trashed. So you start to see issues with you know, leaky gut, you have all these other syndromes with the gut, um, you have issues with absorption, you have issues with um, all the neurotransmitters that you could be making, cortisol, um, melatonin, it's just panathenic acid, B5, all the Bs. I mean, it's just a cascade of effects. And I learned a lot from Dr. Sasha Gamanak on just the different aspects and the parts of the brain, the neurotransmitters um, needed to flip the switches and keep the clocks going in the part of the brain that we need them to are saturated with vitamin D receptors. And any place that there is a vitamin D receptor, it needs vitamin D. So when the majority of the population is walking around with either not only vitamin D deficiency, but insufficiency, we're just not going to uh, work as well as we normally would. So D levels affect paralysis and it affects the sleep clock switch. So let's look at like a paralysis switch in the brain. What can happen if our paralysis switch is not right? We could have apnea where we're not breathing. We could be walking when we shouldn't be. We can be talking when we shouldn't be. We should be, we could be bruxing or chewing when we shouldn't be. Legs moving, waking up in just horrific pain because we weren't paralyzed like we should be at night. So we wake up achy all over our bodies. Um, REM behavior disorders. We're acting out our dreams when we should be paralyzed. Why isn't our brain paralyzing our body like it should? And then there's the sleep clock issue. Now that's insomnia, advanced sleep phase issues, waking up every night at three in the morning, circadian rhythm disorders, decreased REM sleep, decreased slow wave sleep. And what happens if the sleep timing and the paralysis cascades start malfunctioning from a lack of repair or low vitamin D? So now our sleep timing and paralysis switches aren't operating correctly. So you could then be awake, but you're dreaming. You could be awake, but you're paralyzed. Awake, but now you're falling to the ground paralyzed. Awake and falling to the ground moving, which kineoplexy can look like a seizure, but the big difference with kineoplexy and actual grand mal seizure is a grand mal seizure has amnesia involved. Kineoplexy is the patient remembers everything. Uh, grandma seizure, they will remember nothing. Um, or involuntary sleep attacks. I fall asleep for no reason out of the blue. I'm supposed to be awake, but I fall asleep. 
Uh, here's a study showing vitamin D and the gut microbiome and the endocannabinoid system. And I have another lecture where I go into, I mean, we all are hearing about CBD, CBG, CBN, you know, and the role in sleep. There is a huge role for the endocannabinoid system and sleep health. And I believe in the next five years or so, we're going to see an explosion of cannabinoid science and phytocannabinoids are just helping people immensely get the sleep they need. But why are we not able to make our own endocannabinoids? We have 2-AG and an anamide. Those are our own endocannabinoids. And really the endocannabinoid system wasn't even discovered until the 90s. Similar to, you know, we had all the opiates and we didn't know we had an entire receptor system that responded to opiates. And we also have a whole system of, uh, that responds to aspirin and that was from willow bark. So it's a matter of time. And it just, we need to be aware if we're dealing with sleep health that yes, there is a place for phytocannabinoids and that science is growing. So just be open to it and maybe start researching it more. Um, but the question is, is why, why, why do we stop making our own endocannabinoids? And again, it goes back to the microbiome in the gut. Also magnesium and sleep, extremely interwoven with each other. 60 to 70% of Americans are deficient. Most physicians do not even test for magnesium deficiencies because um, it's so rampant. So a lot of times they'll just go by your symptoms and say, hey, let's start putting you on some kind of magnesium. Um, women typically can start around 300, 350 milligrams. Um, men can kind of go up all the way and play around up to the 700s. I personally take magnesium every night. I take about 400 milligrams and I sleep awesome. It's important for deep, slow wave sleep. It is so important in so many, it's like the third most important a mineral in our body, but you know, almost three fourths of Americans are deficient in it, just like everything else. I mean, we are a pretty sick society. It also helps with restless leg syndrome, insomnia, migraines, ADD, ADHD. But again, why? Why is it helping with that, those different things? Again, it helps with sleep. So when you help with sleep, you can help with migraines, you can help with ADD, ADHD. Um, I'll go into some other things about ADHD here in just a few minutes, which is interesting with iron. Um, so I wanted to go over some signs and symptoms. These are things that we can look at, um, not only in kiddos, most of this you can look at your adults, but boy, if we can get to these kids and start seeing this stuff early, we make such an impact so early. Open mouth posture. We all know like Napoleon Dynamite, the mouth hanging open, but it doesn't have to be that dramatic. Even a child with just their lips lightly parted, just sitting in your chair, that's mouth breathing. And sometimes I'll take a business card and just put it in their mouth and tell them, okay, I'm gonna have you hold this business card for me and I'll have them hold it with their lips and see if they can, they should be able to sit there for a minute and breathe through their nose effortlessly. Because a lot of times parents don't really realize it. And then when the parent sees that business card in there and they see, them start to kind of move and that business card flaps. They're like, oh, they really are having a hard time breathing through their nose. But especially if you have a CBCT machine, I'm telling you, I find, I just found, I had three sisters this week, huge adenoids. And the one that had the biggest adenoids was the three and a half year old. And the doctor just keeps putting tubes in her ears and more tubes in her ears. And she's mouth breathing and she's snoring at night. And, you know, something to tell parents when they're like, well, my kid snores. Yeah. Or, you know, it's not, not that big of a deal is let them know the American Academy of Pediatrics has a zero tolerance for snoring. And that's based on the Karen Bonick study, zero tolerance, no child should snore. You know, I get it. They have a cold and it was just a few weeks of it and they are fine and they're not snoring anymore, but chronic snoring, nope, zero tolerance. Um, no spacing between baby teeth is a malocclusion or even worse. If you see crowded baby teeth, that is a severe malocclusion. Grinding of teeth, bruxism, um, that is a sign there could be an airway disorder, but also that could be a sign that they have 
poor iron stores. Uh, history of chronic ear infections, tubes in the ears. These are things I ask in my health histories. Large adenoids are pushing off that eustachian tube and they cannot drain. So they're constantly trying to put the tubes in to drain it from the other side. And the problem is really on the other end where the, the, um, the adenoids are putting pressure. Nightly snoring, obviously that's a big flag. Tethered tissues, tongue, labial ties, um, crowded mixed dentition or permanent dentition, dentition, even without a dental crossbite, which I usually go into that more so talking about skeletal crossbites um, because the teeth will tip lingually and compensate and you don't see the dental crossbite because the teeth have compensated for that um, poor amount of bone. But when you look at the maxilla versus the, the mandible, the maxilla should be a good five millimeters wider than the mandible. And a lot of times you see these really lingually inclined molars and you see the mandible bone out here and the maxilla bone like this. And it's, it's opposite. Um, kids that fidget in the chair, difficulty focusing, ADD, ADHD, again, Restless leg syndrome is not just a nighttime thing. It is exacerbated in sleep and it is exacerbated with fatigue. But a lot of these patients, adults alike, but kiddos too, they can't sit still. It's like literally they can't sit still. They have this urge to have to move their legs. A lot of these kiddos could have an iron issue. Um, and there is genetic aspects of that where they don't process nor do they store iron well in the brain. And right now there's no way to test iron stores in the brain. So we can only do neck down testing with the serum ferritin levels. But if again, RLS is as prevalent as diabetes. So start asking these questions. Look at these kiddos moving around all the time. It's like, it's very uncomfortable to have RLS. Um, and you can make a world of difference. 80% of children with RLS respond very well to oral iron supplementation. Once in a while, they might need IV or some medication, but 80%, it, it's an iron supplement. And you're changing their sleep. You're changing their life. They can focus in school. They're getting more rest, um, even helping with the bruxism aspect. Uh, circles under the eyes, venous pooling. Enlarged tonsils, again, we know infection doesn't have to be present. It's just the size can be functionally a problem. And enlarged adenoids visible on the CBCT. So here is uh, some pretty big adenoids here, uh, some impressive tonsils. Uh, and this is a friend of mine, Dr. Audrey Yoon, uh, just released a study that expansion alone decreased lymphoid tissues, both adenoids and tonsils in size which this is something that anecdotally, a lot of us practitioners have been seeing and we just didn't have anything to um, back it up other than anecdotally, we're seeing like, hey, it's interesting. I did some expansion and now they can breathe better through their nose. Why is that? And uh, this is a really good study to say, hey, maybe this is why, maybe we can, you know, it's a start. We can start supporting some of the things we've been seeing anecdotally in our practices. But in this study, um, post-expansion, the uh, 36 out of 40 adenoids um, decreased in volume and 39 out of the 40 tonsils decreased in volume. Uh, they found 90 and 97% of patients experienced significant reduction in the adenoid and tonsils. The average volume reduction was 16.8% in the adenoids and 38.5 in tonsils after RPE. Again, RPE, slow expansion, semi-rapid, there's different types. Um, doesn't mean the other types of expansions don't do this. We just know typically orthodontists do RPE. It'll be interesting. I would love to see different types of expansion and see um, what happens with those as well. But I'll take what I can get, you know, at least this is supporting what we've been seeing. Chronic ear infections, again, all my health history, uh, tubes in the ears, you see that in your uh, kiddos a lot, then you need to start saying, hmm, maybe these, these adenoids are big. And there's the adenoid, here's the eustachian tube, and you can see why these kids are um, basically being 
their eustachian tubes are being pinched off. Something that's interesting with kids with enlarged adenoids too, I'll just throw in there. Supine sleep is usually the worst position for humans to sleep in. The exception to that is a child with enlarged adenoids. And it's because the adenoids are fixed on the posterior aspect of the nasopharynx. So when the child lays supine, the adenoids pull back and now they can breathe better through their nose. But everybody else, supine sleep is pretty much horrible. And also supine sleep will instantly trigger um, nasal congestion. It's just due to fluid dynamics. Uh, but it is interesting that children with enlarged adenoids, supine sleeping does help them um, until things can be rectified. Here's an example of what you want to see in, in children and you rarely do. And when I do see it, I like pull all my staff in the room and like, look at him, look how great his arches are. Cause that's usually what we see. And then that's what they're gonna be. Um, what looks adorable to parents, it's like, now that's what they're gonna look like. Their bone is so deficient. Their permanent teeth are so much bigger. There's no way they're gonna fit in there. We need this. Um, so the bigger question is, is when you see this, or you don't see this and you see this, the, the thing to do is not jump into, ooh, I wanna expand. Yes, we're dentists. We wanna fix things. We wanna help create more bone for this kiddo. Absolutely. But ask the question, why? Why is this happening in this kid? Most likely they're not breathing well. Something has triggered a cascade of poor growth and development. Uh, this is courtesy of Dr. Audrey Yoon as well. This is a ClinCheck for a two-year-old. Um, she does some um, intrusion of the molars where she can get an auto rotation of the mandible. And she can, I mean, that's a big difference in a child. When you can move that mandible forward like that, just from intrusion Invisalign, these two-year-olds, I'm telling you, they rock these Invisalign trays. I've got three-year-olds in Invisalign trays um, and it makes a world of difference. Um, the asymmetries that you can correct right away. Um, I put a myo munchie with it, help with the function. It's just amazing what you can see. So you got a malocclusion, you're trying to create more bone um, and they're still, they're so juicy and squishy at this age. Things just move so fast and they're so compliant. It's, it's kind of crazy. People are like, I can't believe you do Invisalign on kids, but it, it, I'd rather do it on them than a teenager. Uh, another thing that we can't evaluate for, but just know it exists, it's rare. Um, this was from uh, Dr. Ron Mitchell. Um, he's an ENT that was part of the chat study in St. Louis. The, uh, it was a really big study. And he has since moved to Texas, but he gave me this slide showing an example of the epiglottis laryngomalacia, where the epiglottis actually during inspiration will fall over the trachea and uh, obstruct the airway. That's not anything we can identify, but this is again, I'm just showing you, this, this is why we need our medical colleagues. Don't go rogue, don't try to do this on your own. You gotta be with a team, a, a team of other dentists, mentors, learn from each other, um, and have your medical colleagues. We need them and they need us. So what do we know so far? Mouth breathing and snoring can start at birth and is a sign of a child in need of help. Uh, it can lead to neurological changes as early as the first year of their life. Changes produced by snoring, apnea, flow limitation, resisted breathing in an infant can lead to executive function issues at ages four and seven with neurobehavioral and neurocognitive consequences. Treatment requires a team approach and the airway centered dentist, which as Steve Carsonson says, we are now the primary care of the airway. We are critical members of this team and early treatment can change the path of a kid's quality of life. We can start treatment as young as two and early diagnosis and intervention is, is crucial. Dr. Stephen Sheldon says if we have, you know, we have to diagnose early because of the oxygen deprivation and sleep fragmentation. If we don't fix it by five, it's broken and it's broken for good, which goes back to the study of children that snore between four and six. However, they stop snoring around 11, 12, 13. The cognitive deficits are already there. 
I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. I tend to talk too much. Okay, current standard for pediatric OSA treatment within the medical community right now is TNA removal and CPAP. But in based on the study, it can be anywhere from 40% to 70% not curative. Does it mean we don't do it? Not necessarily. Um, there's studies with expansion, then TNA removal, TNA removal, then expansion. The bottom line is most of the time you need both. It's not that you don't take out tonsils and adenoids. It's, it's not that you expect to cure from the TNA, but it's part of the puzzle. And now with Audrey's research out of Stanford, it'll be interesting if maybe we start doing some expansion first and just see what happens in certain cases where maybe it isn't so severe. Um, maybe we got a little bit of time. Maybe it's a mild case and parents wanna just do some expansion first. Why not? And let's see if we get some natural reduction of those lymphoid tissues. Um, but they need us. You know, aside from CPAP, you know, the ENTs, the pediatric sleep physicians, the pediatricians, they need us. They need us to help. The majority of the kiddos where it's not curative, um, 3D imaging showed that there was abnormal oral facial development in the kids. And nasal CPAP therapy is long-term and it's not an option. It's actually stunting the growth. There was a study done in chest on grown men wearing nasal CPAP. After two years, it created a class three relationship. It pushed things back. And that's in a man done growing. What about a soft child that's still growing and we're stunting that maxilla? Um, that's not a long-term option. Some kids need it for a while, but if we can partner with some dentists that know what they're doing and try to wean these children off of a CPAP, that'd be great. Uh, so right now, the combination of tonsil and adenoid removal, palatal expansion and craniofacial development, and about six months of oral facial myofunctional therapy tends to kind of be the sweet spot for long-term um, resolution. I don't want to say cure, but at least a long-term resolution for several years is what they're finding. Um, Christian Guimano, uh, he's like the father of sleep medicine. Um, he basically had a conversation with my partner, Michelle, and he said before he passed, um, you dentists don't know what you can do for these kids. Medicine can diagnose the condition. They can manage and give the child allergy medications and a CPAP, but you dentists can help treat it. And I just thought that was so um, important that he said that. I mean, there's a call to action to us for sure. And these are, um, this picture is so upsetting. It, these are post-mortem pictures of kiddos that passed away in their sleep. And um, I know that a couple of the parents had actually gone to the pediatrician and said, hey, something's not right with my kid. One of them was turning blue and frothing. And the pediatrician said, well, they'll outgrow it. And unfortunately, there's still some pediatricians, God love them, but they still feel uh, they'll outgrow it. But according to the studies, you might outgrow the snoring, but, but you don't outgrow the neurocognitive deficits. Um, sleep is very complex. And like I said, I mean, you've got anatomical aspects, you've got function, you know, you've got the anatomy, you've got the neurology, you've got the nutritional aspects. It's multifaceted and we have to have a team approach and work together because we might be the only healthcare provider to guide this kiddo and their family in the right direction, changing their lives forever. And once you start seeing these things, you can't unsee them. And it really changes the way you practice and it in turn changes the lives of the patients that you care for. And I love this saying, Many things can wait, children cannot. Today their bones are being formed, their blood is being made, their senses are being developed. To them, we cannot say tomorrow, their name is today. I wanted to thank everybody. Um, I do have some free forms if you want. I've got blood order forms that you can have, um, sleep questionnaires, data collection forms. If you wanna scan the QR code, they're yours. Just enter your name. I believe we ask for your email address and we'll send them to you. And I just want to thank you for listening. Um, and hopefully tomorrow, maybe you'll start looking and asking some questions that you didn't maybe think to ask before. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ochoa. That was 
fantastic information. Um, we do have, I think, time for a couple of questions. So I will go ahead and start those. Um, one question, I was wondering if you use phonetic bite or George gauge to determine the position of appliance. Well, it depends on, um, and everybody's gonna have a position on this. I, I really, I, I kind of like to look at the vertical too. Um, I find in my, now this is for adult patients. Um, I used to be George Gage, George Gage, George Gage. And now I, I like to look at the, the vertical. And for me, sometimes I don't have to do as much advancement when I'm addressing vertical as well. And uh, which form of magnesium do you take? That's a great question. Um, so typically I, I always do the, like the citrate, um, the, they all end in the eights. <laughs> the oxides can cause diarrhea. So magnesium oxide. Now, if you're someone that struggles with constipation, then you might want to take the magnesium oxide because it will definitely alleviate the constipation. But if you are pretty regular, you want to probably avoid the magnesium oxides. Okay, perfect. Um, and I think that kind of wraps up the questions. There's a few other maybe statements in there, but just for time's sake, we'll, we'll wrap it up um, there. But again, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined tonight. Very much appreciated. If they do, if they are interested in those forms, did you say where they could find those? Um, actually, yes. You, I had a QR code. You can go to asappathway.com and go to free gift. And that's where we'll send you all the forms. And it includes the blood screening that I order, I, the blood, all the iron paneling I like to get, um, the B12 and the 25 hydroxy D. Um, and then there's data collection forms you can do with as you wish, put your own logos on it. Um, but if anything, if you don't know, you look at these forms and you're like, what in the world do I do with these forms? It, it gets you thinking, you know, there's so many courses out there. There's different ways for you to learn. And it just starts you uh, on your journey of maybe asking more questions, so. Awesome. Well, great, thank you again. Um, Great information. One of the comments is uh, insightful and clinically applicable for our membership. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate thank it. Thank you and so much. And thank you for having me. And thanks yes. for everybody being here tonight. I know we've had long days. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Thanks.